Well, welcome everyone. It's great to be with you again. I hope the kids and those who are able to gather on Zoom have had a great time uh, with the kids' talk and uh, encouraging one another and praying together. We're going to start out with a kids' song today, uh, a song reminding us that our God is a great big God who loves us to bits. Thanks, Rob. does. He's a great big God. He's a great holy God as well. And so we come before him with our praise and worship the one true King of Kings, the Holy One.
Indeed he will. Our God is the big God and the God who reigns. So we come to him in prayer and I'd love you to join me with this prayer of the day. O God, your son has taught us that we must receive your sovereign rule like a little child. Help us to turn to you in faith and simplicity of heart so that we may receive your blessing and enter the kingdom your son has promised through the same Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Amen. Sandra is now going to continue to lead us in prayer. Faithful God, you are full of grace and mercy, and so we have confidence that you will listen to our requests and will provide for all our needs. Lord, we thank you that we can wholly trust you as we pray for your church, our world, our nation, our communities and our loved ones. Lord God, you have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive our resolve to address environmental and climate issues. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for all you have created. Give our world leaders clarity and a combined sincerity to work together to find ways of preserving all that is good for the health of the earth and its peoples. We pray for compassionate action in parts of the world suffering drought, natural disasters, disease and terrorism. We pray for those struggling with oppression and hardship. We remember the plight of the people in Afghanistan where the Taliban are enforcing their extreme regime on the people, particularly the women, the poor and the outcast. Please help aid agencies to find safe ways to bring relief through organisations like the Anglican Development and Relief Fund. And as Germany seeks to establish a newly elected governing party and a new leader, guide them in their decisions so that there is a smooth transition of leadership. Grant wisdom, integrity and humility to all earthly leaders. Make the welfare of their people more important than their own agenda and power. Help us all to celebrate and support our world as one human family especially at this time of people suffering around the world from COVID-19. We pray for fair and effective sharing of vaccines so that the poorest peoples and most remote communities can benefit as much as wealthier nations. Protect, dear Lord, all health workers as they look after those who are infected or as they deliver the vaccines. God of grace, hear our prayer. Lord, assist our parish as your family to lovingly befriend those around us in need. Help us to show kindness, bring encouragement, be patient in our interactions and resolute in our opportunities to show your love to others. Bless all young people and their teachers as they return to learning this week. We pray for those who are struggling through lack of employment or because of current restrictions. We thank you for our local council our Mayor Jen Alden, and for all the benefits we enjoy here in Bendigo, for our local services, our tradespeople, the food and the other necessities we can so easily obtain and take for granted sometimes. As Trev, Cindy and the family return from their holidays, we pray that they have been refreshed and praise you for their ministry among us. We thank you too for our church warden's work across the diocese, and for Eddie Bartlett in his ministry to the Sifing community. While we are blessed to be able to worship openly and freely, Lord, there are Christians around the world who can't do this. Today we remember the Christians in Iraq, that they might have jobs so that they can remain there and continue in their Christian witness. God of grace, hear our prayer. Lord, let all who suffer in mind, body or spirit find welcome and healing in you. Today we have been asked to pray for Melissa, Dorothy, Tom, Elizabeth, Alan, Anne, Brian, Glenda, Robin, Judy and George and Catherine. Besides these, we take a moment to pray for others known to us who are ill, sad, hurt, longing for comfort and healing. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
Holy God, as we go our separate ways this week, we ask that you would remind us all of the blessings you have given us, your creation, our homes, our families, our friends and neighbours. May we readily share what we have been blessed with and connect with others in whatever way we can to encourage and to be encouraged. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And it's a great entry point into our teaching today because we're going to learn uh, a whole bunch more about what it is to be in Christ alone as Fiona preaches to us. So let's listen now to the Bible readings and then Fiona will lead us. The reading comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This reading is from Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Hello everyone, my name's Fiona Preston and if I haven't met you yet, I am a community chaplain and a member of the 11am service here at HT. Well, this is the second sermon in the series on Ephesians and if you missed the first sermon last week by Bishop Matt, I encourage you to look it up online and have a listen. The passage today starts with the phrase, as for you, doesn't it? And like all passages and books in the Bible, we want to know what that means for us. We want to know what is Christ trying to speak to us and tell us. Today, however, I would like us to take some time to look at who Paul was writing to originally, who were the original recipients of this letter, because that will give us a far richer understanding of the passage, but also of God, who God is and what his intentions were and are. Paul, in this letter to the church of Ephesus, begins the passage with a statement to the Gentiles. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Paul is here reminding the Gentiles that before they were saved by faith, they were like people who were walking around dead. Dead to their sins. In fact, the writer here points out that the Gentiles followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Did the Gentiles go about worshipping this kingdom of the air? Well, this phrase might be referring to a Jewish concept where there were three heavens in view. The second, or middle heaven, in between the atmosphere and God's throne room, represented the invisible domain of spiritual warfare, from which the devil still ruled in the lives of unbelievers. So what Paul is saying here is that if you're not in Christ and you're not worshipping him, therefore by default you're worshipping something else. We as Christians understand this to be Satan. One may not be consciously or actively 
worshipping Satan, what this verse is saying is that one would be following the ways of the world. In fact, Ephesians 6 goes on to say, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. So if we're not in Christ, where are we? Well, the church in Ephesus, like many of the new and emerging ancient churches, was made up of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And this often posed issues of integration. On one hand, you have the Jewish people, the chosen people of God, the Israelites. They were chosen by God to be his holy people, and they had been living by God's laws, by the Torah, for ever. These laws spelt out God's requirements for living so that when they sinned, they could make a sacrifice in the temple to atone for their sin. We need to understand how ingrained these laws were in their living, but also how they saw themselves as the chosen people of God. Then you had the Gentiles, who came from various backgrounds. Many of them would have grown up worshipping false gods and idols. They were different people, from different backgrounds, from different cultures, living different ways of life. How would you imagine these groups coped with integrating together? When they chose, both groups chose faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, how would they have gone integrating? Would it have been all embracing and loving and easy? I don't know that that would be the case. In fact, many of Paul's letters are written to address these issues. When I was in high school, I changed schools at the end of year eight. And perhaps you have also had the experience of changing schools in your journey. There's this period of time when you transition from one school to the next and you feel like an outsider, an alien, just looking in from the outskirts. For me, I transferred from a public school to a private girls' school. And after my first week at the new school, I remember going home to my parents and saying, what have you done to me? I felt like they had colluded with the new school against me to put me with all the brainiacs and the well-behaved girls. And it was like there was this unspoken code of behaviour in the classroom that I had to adjust to. Changing jobs can have a similar feeling. The first couple of weeks at a new job, everything's new. You have to adjust to new systems, new people, new tasks new ways of doing things. Well, this might have been a little of how the Jewish Christians and Gentiles felt as they began to do church together. Only the biggest difference being was that the Gentiles didn't need to conform to the Jews, nor the Jews to the Gentiles. All were being made new in Christ, which I'll get to in a moment. Verse 3, Paul then addresses the Israelite community and he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. All of us. See, Paul was also a Jewish Christian, so he counts himself in that group. The Jewish Christians, he is saying, are not exempt Basically, Paul says, we too, Jewish Christians, have also lived among the ways of the world. The ruler of the kingdom of the air. We chose to gratify the cravings of our flesh too, he says. Let's look at that. Flesh, our flesh has cravings. 1 Corinthians 10 
Verse 13, Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So all mankind is subject to fleshly cravings and we can gratify these cravings or we can resist them. Paul goes on to say, like the rest, like the rest, verse 3, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So the Israelites, when they failed to live by the laws that God set out for them, when they failed these laws and gratified their desires, they too were deserving of wrath. But not only that, I'm struck by the term by nature. By nature deserving of wrath. By nature, Jews and Gentiles, our human nature is deserving of God's wrath. Why? Because instead of doing things God's perfect and beautiful way, as he intended life to be, humans sinned. They chose free will. And if we have free will, we'll often choose to gratify the cravings of our flesh. So we have Paul first speaking to the Gentiles, telling them that they were dead in their sins. And then he turns to the Jews and says, wait, you guys were also dead in your sins, all of them deserving of God's wrath. It's fairly grim and hopeless at this point. So this is where I want to include us. You and I, the readers of this letter in today's day and age. Because this letter does apply to us. Technically, we are like the Gentiles, included by faith into God's story. We, as Christian believers, were dead in our sins to the ruler of the kingdom of the air before we found ourselves in Christ, before we chose Christ. So let's turn to verse, verse 4 together. Verse 4, but, it starts with a big but, because of his great love for us, because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even when we were dead to our transgressions. God, instead of giving us what we deserved, gave us mercy. Because he is rich in mercy. Our God is rich in kindness. He is rich in forgiveness. He's not a stingy God. He's rich. He is overflowing. So he made all who believed in him all alive in Christ. Jews and Gentiles are now unified in God's mercy and have all been made alive in Christ. They are unified with Christ and we also are unified in Christ and share in Christ's status. It's by grace you have been saved. Paul says this twice in verses 5 and verse 8. It's by grace you have been saved. He did it. We were dead in our transgressions, fact, and we are saved by grace, fact. Let's look at that a bit more. You'll notice that verses 1 to 4 focus on the sinful nature. But now we can turn and see all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Paul says to the Ephesians, you guys, you're co-heirs with Christ. You're exalted with him in the heavenly realms. We're unified together in this same way. This salvation that was just for the Israelites is now for all, and we are all co-heirs with Christ, all of us. Can you imagine 
what a mind bender that would have been for the Jews to have all these unchosen people suddenly included with them as chosen. And can you imagine the mind bend for the Gentiles, realising that they could be included in God's chosen people? Why? Why did God do this? Verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Nothing compares to the riches of God's grace in Christ Jesus. Nothing is as precious, as valuable as the riches of God's grace. And these riches of his grace will be shown age after age after age to all generations to come, all generations. Verse 8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. What did the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians both have in common? Faith. Faith. Believing that Jesus was the long-awaited-for Messiah, that he died on the cross, carrying the weight of the sin of the world, every person's sins, past, present and future, on his shoulders. That he died, that he conquered sin, that he was raised back to life by God as the just and perfect king. And all that is required is faith. This verse tells us that grace is not from ourselves so that no one can boast and even suggests that faith is a gift from God, that God himself helps us and allows us to have faith so that no one can boast. It's all about what God has done for us. Verse 9. Paul wants the Jews and the Gentiles and us to know that it's only by faith in Jesus Christ that we're forgiven and become co-heirs with Christ. Not because of anything we could or have done. For the Jews, they did not earn their inheritance by being God's chosen people. And the Gentiles also didn't do anything particularly special to earn their salvation. Again, if we go back to verse 5, God made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgressions. And then we come to verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, as a chaplain and a Christian who's been around long enough, I know that this verse is where people can get a little unstuck. The passage has just told us that we're not saved by works, but then it tells us that God has created us to do good works. How do these things go together? And what good works could possibly make us worthy of God's standards? Well, firstly, the passage says that we're God's handiwork, created by him. We are his creation. And as his creation, we're functional beings. So as beings created by him to function... He must have a purpose for our functioning. It makes sense, doesn't it? And God has prepared these works in advance for us to do. So we don't have to worry that we're going to miss them somehow or miss what these things might be. We need to trust God that he knows best. Secondly, the Bible, God's word, is full of things that he would ask for us, good works for us to do. And Jesus speaks of them a lot in the Gospels. For example, the first and second commandments. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. 
These are good things to do. Or Matthew 28, go and make disciples. Or James 1, 27, care for the widows and the orphans. The Bible is rich of these things, these suggestions. The most important thing is that we know that they don't earn our salvation. They are things that God has intended for us as his functional beings. Well, to end, I personally am just filled with a sense of praise for God. I'm filled with this sense of praise for God who is rich in mercy, who saves us from our sinful nature and raises us as co-heirs with Christ. I'm filled with praise for our God who saves us by grace, not by anything we could do. I want to praise God because all he asks from us is to have faith in him. And I want to praise God that he made us as functional beings to do good things. So let's end today by praising God. Amen. Well, what a wonderful passage to be reminded of how much God in Christ has done for us, that we are alive with him, that because the man of sorrows came and paid it all for us, we can live by grace, by faith with God forever. So uh, let's sing and celebrate this great story that we have with this song, Man of Sorrows.
us, friends, indeed. We are saved to bring glory to the name of Jesus, glory to the name of the Father. We have so much to praise our God for, and he has saved us that we would do good works and go into the world to love and bless this world that he has made and he loves and he would call to himself. So go in the name of the Lord to be that blessing. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. See you next week, everybody.